Hey there everybody and welcome to this presentation on oppositional defiant conduct and impulse control disorders a trauma-informed perspective I'm your host Dr. Donnelly Snipes in this video we're going to identify disorders in this category of impulse control disorders and then we'll review the diagnostic criteria specifically for oppositional defiant conduct and intermittent explosive disorder as well as pyro and kleptomania we'll briefly review differential diagnosis we'll talk about suicid suicidality risk and then we will finish up by talking about current best practices from what we know right now um, to treat these disorders in the dsm-5 tr the category is disruptive impulse control and conduct disorders in this category is oppositional defiant disorder intermittent explosive disorder conduct disorder pyromania kleptomania unspecified disruptive impulse control disorder and antisocial personality disorder now you might be thinking uh Dr Snipes antisocial personality disorder is in the personality disorders category yes it is but it is also in this one so that's kind of an interesting little caveat that we have that some of these disorders occur in multiple categories but we'll cover that when we get to personality disorders oppositional defiant disorder is characterized by a pattern of behavior with at least one person who is not a sibling lasting more than six months as evidenced by four or more symptoms which are not developmentally appropriate for an individual's age gender and culture straight out of the dsm-5 tr i have concerns about indicating that certain behaviors may be more or less appropriate by gender however that's what's in there so pointing out that the diagnostic criteria does highlight some very um, specific caveats the other thing that i think is interesting in oppositional defiant disorder is it's a pattern of behavior with at least one person so the symptoms four or more symptoms are going to be present frequently for more than six months toward one person behavior is communication behavior changes when people have experienced trauma and we are going to learn that there's a very very strong correlation and in some cases they're stepping it up to even indicate that there may be causation that trauma is one of the root causes for oppositional defiant disorder and potentially conduct disorders and I think that is really important that when we're diagnosing we don't misdiagnose oppositional defiant disorder for a, um, a trauma in, in, uh, trauma caused disorder that may not rise to the level of PTSD a lot of your adverse childhood experiences or your ACEs do not meet criteria for PTSD so it could be an unspecified trauma related disorder as opposed to oppositional defiant disorder we really need to explore what the root cause is think about it just from a stigmatization and discrimination standpoint and I hate to say it but our culture uh, even in the medical communities does tend to not look fondly upon people diagnosed with things like oppositional defiant disorder conduct disorder antisocial personality or even borderline personality disorders these disorders um, which are in many cases understandable adaptations to traumatic events um, communicate to people that don't know the patient hey this person's a problem and that's not okay that is not okay we need to start really exa examining behaviors from a communication standpoint and say how is this how did this behavior develop in what way might this behavior have emerged to protect the person okay so off my soapbox 
four or more symptoms which are not developmentally appropriate for the individual. Now, I want you to remember that ODD is typically diagnosed in children and adolescents under 18. Uh, and when we make those diagnoses, when you think about children and people that are going through puberty, there is a lot of uh, mood swings, there can be emotional turmoil, there can be a lot of these behaviors that emerge either in real life or online. Uh, especially in the past 20 years as social media has crept up and it has become easier to be vindictive from a distance, I guess. However, so let's look at these cr criteria, four or more, and there's a bunch of them. It takes up three slides. Angry or irritable mood. They often lose their temper. They may be touchy or easily annoyed, and they're often angry and resentful. Now remember, this is toward one particular person or many particular people. At least one particular person is, bears the brunt of these symptoms, which again, I think we need to look at what is it about that person that elicits these behaviors? Were they rewarded or reinforced in some way by that person? Was there some social learning that other people behave this way toward that person and there were no negative consequences? So the identified patient learned that, hey, it's okay to behave that way. Or does that person somehow represent a threat and the identified patient is in some way trying to protect themselves from that person. Or a fourth option, remember chronic uh, stress, whether it's due to CPTSD, and I know that's not actually a diagnosis yet, uh, but chronic trauma, chronic stress leads to HPA axis dysregulation or the stress response becoming dysregulated, which leads to emotional dysregulation. So we may be seeing a, an individual who doesn't have adequate skills and tools to cope with emotional dysregulation. They don't have adequate skills and tools to feel safe. So we want to look at attachment related traumas. We want to look at other adverse childhood experience related traumas as well that may have contributed to a feeling of unsafeness and disempowerment and maybe even prevented them from developing emotional intelligence and the ability to modulate, identify and modulate their own feelings and responses. Interestingly, with the angry and irritable mood category, the DSM-5 TR notes, temper loss need not always involve tantrum behavior and can be displayed by angry facial expressions, verbal expressions of anger, and subjective feelings of anger that would not typically be considered a tantrum. So that makes this angry, irritable mood pretty amorphous here. And I want you to think, if you've raised teenagers like I have, how often there were periods where the children might go through, or adolescents might grow, go through phases where they were trying to individuate. So they would become irritable. They would become moody sometimes and they would roll their eyes. And I know, I, I remember very distinctly my children. I swear I could hear their eyes rolling, even if I had my back turned to them. Uh, but that is developmentally appropriate. They are, in, in many cases, they are learning how to individuate. They're learning how to become assertive. So we really need to look at the frequency, the whether it's an ongoing issue, and the magnitude of the irritability and and oppositionality, if that's even a word. But remembering that according to the DSM-5 TR, it doesn't even have to be a full out tantrum. The person can have a subjective feeling of anger and that qualifies. Another set of criteria that we can choose from for these four plus symptoms, often argues with authority figures or actively defies or refuses to comply with requests from authority figures or with rules. This could be, as I mentioned before, something that has been reinforced 
in prior interactions with adults and authority figures where the child was told to do something and they didn't do it. They were like, whatever. And then there were no consequences. So the child learned that there are no consequences for being oppositional. And so why should they do something if they don't want to? On the other hand, their trauma may have been at the hands of an authority figure or authority figures who were reticent to protect them from traumas. So they could have um, deep-seated anger and hostility towards authority figures thinking, well, why should I trust you? And I'm going to do what I think is going to keep me safe or make me happy. Obviously, each individual is going to be different, but I really, in this presentation, I really want you to start thinking about what is this behavior communicating? Where might it have originated from? And is it the result of what in later life might be termed antisocial behavior, lack of empathy, or is it the result of a uh, trauma response? The final two category or criteria in the category of argumentative defiant behavior is often deliberately annoys others and often blames others for his or her mistakes or behavior. Developmentally appropriate again. I remember when my children were younger, when they were in elementary school, they were four years apart and they would be sitting in the back of the car, we'd be going somewhere, and one would de deliberately start annoying the other. And we would have this whole to do. And it was almost a game. The annoyer was amused by an being annoying. However, they both went back and forth doing it. They were siblings. So remember, this has to be a non-sibling that this uh, behavior is engaged with, but it doesn't say it has to be an adult. So it can be a peer with whom they are being deliberately annoying. Often blaming others for their mistakes or misbehavior. This can be something that developed as a result of reinforcement. They learned that th through either seeing others do it or through doing it and not experiencing punishment, that they can blame others for behavior. Or it may have developed out of fear because the behavior was, the, the punishment was so harsh that they, they are terrified of getting in trouble. So it is a safety or a survival standpoint uh, mechanism to blame other people. They did it. I didn't do it in order to prevent the harsh discipline. The DSM-5-TR goes on to note, individuals with oppositional defiant disorder typically do not regard themselves as angry or defiant. They justify their behavior in response to unreasonable demands or circumstances. It is important to identify whether what the person's perception is. If they are being argumentative or defiant in order to protect themselves because they're fearful, that could be a response from prior trauma. What you perceive is going on as the caregiver or the target of the oppositional defiant behavior may be very benign in nature. However, what the target perceives may be something that is very threatening or triggering to them. Again, it also could be something that just developed as a result of never experiencing consistent discipline or um, corrective measures when they were oppositional or defiant before. So now they perceive any demands upon them to be unreasonable. And vindictiveness. The person has been spiteful or vindictive at least two times in the last six months. Now, this is toward that identified person or persons. But as I mentioned earlier, unfortunately, we have a plague of vindictiveness that seems to happen in our uh, social media. And it's not just with school children. 
We see it in adults as well, where they may uh, troll one another or engage in flaming wars. I think that's what they still call it. Uh, and that can be perceived as vindictive. If you're trying to um, cancel somebody, that can be seen as vindictive. So has this person been vindictive toward their target at least twice in the last six months? You can see that a lot of this area, especially for children and adolescents whose prefrontal cortex is not fully developed yet, their executive control network is not fully developed yet, so they may tend to be more impulsive and reactive. Uh, they may not have all the skills of distress tolerance yet, so they may be more impulsive and reactive. You can see how a lot of these behaviors may occur relatively frequently in children and, and adolescents, which is why we need to explore what is developmentally and unfortunately culturally appropriate. And what do I mean by that? Before people start to get really upset, what I'm talking about is the, what I perceive as the current um, culture of online communication and flaming and canceling and doing all that kind of stuff. In, back in my day, uh, before computers existed, uh, behaviors tended to be much more subtle. But a lot of these behaviors uh, have become more normative now and it, it pains me to see it. Does that mean we have an increase in ODD? Or does that mean our culture has changed to be more accepting of angry, impulsive, oppositional, and vindictive behavior? That's a question for you to answer. Frequency. These behaviors, these four or more behaviors, in children that are less than five years old. Now, I want you to think about this. Two, three, four-year-old children are going to be oppositional sometimes. Uh, but for children who are less than five years old, the behavior occurs most days for at least six months. So that is, uh, can be very exhausting if the child is engaging in these behaviors. We really need to explore where that might be coming from. Do they have uh, differences? in their neural networking? Are they neuroatypical? Maybe the putting on those clothes that you want them to put on is painful. It's too itchy because they are hypersensitive. Maybe using the soap um, to wash their hair is the smell is too strong or the water that you draw for their bath feels fine to you is too hot for them. So they don't want to engage in these behaviors. And if they are sensitive to temperature, likely they're going to be sensitive to temperature in food as well as uh, things like bath water. So you can see eating and bathing, which are two things that we are still helping children do at this age, um, may be very conflictual if we are not registering, if we are not understanding why the child is resistant to that behavior. So it's important to rule out uh, any uh, neurological differences. And it's not just people with autism spectrum disorder. We see uh, sensory gating issues and sensory integration issues in people with ADHD, which very commonly occurs with oppositional defiant disorder, and people with schizophrenia and a, a fair number of other disorders. Therefore, we really need to ask, has this child experienced some sort of trauma or pain or unsafeness in their environment that we haven't recognized yet? For children that are over five years old, the behavior occurs at least once per week for at least six months. Okay, so one difference here is that when a child is over five years, a lot of times they are engaging in some of the behaviors that under five years the parent used to be heavily involved in. Over five years, 
the child is starting to be more involved in. Start, the child is starting to maybe run their own bath. Um, now, five may be a little bit young, but you see where we're getting away from as much parental involvement or caregiver involvement, which may mean less conflict, 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 uh, because the interactions, the child is becoming more independent. Or it could be that the child has developed compensatory strategies to deal with this. The disturbance in behavior is associated with distress in the individual, so in the, in the child or adolescent, or um, in significant others. So it's causing significant distress in caregivers or um, coworkers or school chums, whomever the target of the behavior is. Or it has a negative impact on other areas of functioning. If the individual is being oppositional defiant in the classroom, then it's having a negative impact on their learning. If they're being oppositional defiant um, in other settings, it may have a negative impact. If they're being oppositional and defiant on, with, their, with their peers, then it's gonna be hard for them to form social connections. So it is important to examine if the behavior is causing them impairment, significant impairment, even if it's not causing them distress, if they think I'm, I'm fine, it's everybody else who's overreacting. But if it's causing them significant impairment in developmental tasks or in activities of daily living, then you know it meets the criteria. Children with oppos oppositional defiant disorder may have experienced a history of hostile parenting. Okay, so this is from the DSM-5 TR. And I'll give you a hint, the American Academy of Family Physicians has some more research on it that we're going to talk about. But according to the DSM-5 TR, children with ODD may have experienced a history of hostile parenting. It's impossible to, to determine if the child caused the parents to be hostile or if the parents' hostility caused the child's problem problematic behavior or both. <sighs> I see a lot of finger pointing and blaming here, and that bothers me. But uh, from a behavioral standpoint, when we start asking what what is this behavior communicating, this gives us some insight. According to the DSM-5 TR, it doesn't matter if hostile parenting or adverse childhood experiences caused the behavior uh, in terms of giving the diagnosis of oppositional defiant disorder if the child meets that diagnosis. In the event that the child may be living in a particularly poor conditions where neglect or mistreat mistreatment may occur, clinical attention to reducing the contribution of the environment may be helpful. You think? I was aghast when I read that. So they're assuming that we would ignore neglectful or uh, neglect or maltreatment and not assume that that is a treatment target and a significant contributing factor? Uh, I was a little appalled. According to the American Academy of Family Physicians, parental psychopathology, which means mood disorders, mental health issues, Abuse, harsh punishment, and inconsistent discipline are common correlates of, correlates of oppositional defiant disorder. Now, these are other ways of naming what a lot of times we call adverse childhood experiences now. In a two, 2014 study with 731 subjects, it was found that parental behavior is, quote, likely causal rather than a response to the child's symptoms. Thought that was interesting. Now, this may not occur in every situation. Remember, if the child is born and they are neuroatypical as an infant, they cannot communicate, mom, that's way too hot, or dad, that's way too hot, or way too cold, or it makes me itchy, or that hurts when you do that. 
they can't communicate that. So normal caregiving behaviors like swaddling, diaper changes, bathing, feeding a lukewarm bottle may actually be painful to the child. So the caregiver has become associated with pain. The child is deemed fussy or high needs. And in reality, they're just trying to communicate the only way they can at that point through crying that, hey, that hurts. So we do need to take a look at that and not just blame the parent and say, um, parental behavior, it's your behavior that caused it. The parent may have do been doing their very, very best trying to be a really good caregiver, but inadvertently traumatizing the child. So we do need to be sensitive to these things and be curious, but not condemning of the course and development of the behaviors. It's important to rule out psychotic disorders, substance abuse, depressive, bipolar, um, and disruptive mood re regulation disorder. Obviously, well, we're gonna talk about differential diagnosis in a minute, but remember disruptive mood dysregulation disorder uh, is another disorder in a different category, but the individual, the child, is typically um, angry and moody most days. It's not just once a week. Um, they're, they're typically angry and moody most days. And we're going to, I have the uh, disruptive mood dysregulation disorder criteria in here that we're going to take a look at in a minute, just to refresh your memory. It is not part of this category, but it is an important differential diagnosis. Specify current severity. If the ODD is confined only to one setting, such as home, school, or at work, or with peers, then it is mild. That should tell you something. What is it about that one particular environment or the people in that one particular environment that is triggering and, or that elicits those behaviors and not the other situations. Get curious, figure out, you know, what, what might be going on here? What's the behavior saying? Moderate. Some symptoms are present in at least two settings. So the child may have more difficulty with emotional dysregulation in multiple settings with multiple people. Severe. Some symptoms are present in three or more settings. So at home, at school, and with peers or at home, at work, and with peers, the individual has at least some symptoms of oppositional defiance. The first symptoms often present in preschool um, and definitely by, by adolescence. So you're going to see the first symptoms of this during the child's formative years, if you will. And, I, and again, I think that's important, really important to examine the child's behavior from a developmental standpoint. Severe recurrent temper outbursts that are grossly out of proportion in intensity or duration to the provocation and inconsistent with the uh, developmental level that occur at least three times per week for at least one year in at least two of three settings. This is disruptive mood dysregulation. Remember this, Temper outbursts in oppositional defiant don't have to be severe. They can be subjective. So that's a different difference there. The, with disruptive mood dysregulation, the mood between temper outbursts is persistently irritable or angry. And there has not been a period of greater than three months without all of the symptoms. The diagnosis should not be made for the first time before age six or after age 18. Remember, oppositional defiant often appears in preschool years, so that's well before age six. Uh, but if you're not seeing the child uh, until after the age of six, it's, you're going to have to really look very carefully at differential diagnosis. 
Conduct disorder. Now, a lot of times, oppositional defiant precedes conduct disorder. Apparently, they can also be um, diagnosed comorbidly. Uh, conduct disorder, in about 40% of the cases, the person goes on to meet criteria for antisocial personality disorder. In conduct disorder, there's a persistent pattern of behavior in which the basic rights of others or major age-appropriate societal norms are violated, as evidenced by three or more of the following symptoms in the past 12 months and at least one criterion in the past six months. Aggression to people and animals. The person often bullies, threatens, or intimidates others. Remember, an oppositional defiant there may be some anger outbursts, but it's generally, I'm going to do what I want to do. It's not overtly aggressive. They often initiate physical fights. They use weapons that can cause physical harm. They've been physically cruel or violent to people or animals. And may have stolen while confronting a victim. Now, three of the symptoms, and we're not finished with all the symptoms, in the past 12 months, and at least one in the past six months. Destruction of property. They've deliberately engaged in fire setting with the intent of causing serious damage, or deliberately destroyed other people's property other than by fire setting, by smashing it, spray painting it, whatever. Deceitfulness or theft has broken into someone else's property, house, building, or car, often lies to obtain goods or favors or avoid obligations, or has stolen items of non-trivial value without confronting a victim. Shoplifting, for example, or uh, stealing somebody's car when they're not in it. Serious violation of rules. They may often stay out at night despite parental prohibitions beginning before the age of 13 years. 13 years, depending on the child, is either 8th grade, ninth grade, right in there. So when they're in middle school or younger, they are going, leaving at night, whether it's climbing out the window or staying out past um, curfew has run away from the home overnight at least twice while living in the parental or parental surrogate home or once without returning for a lengthy period. Lengthy period is not clearly defined, but we're going to assume they mean more than 24 hours, maybe a little bit longer if the child is in their mid to late teens or is often truant from school beginning before the age of 13. So we see serious violation of rules and not um, respecting adults or societal norms beginning before the age of 13 years in most of these symptoms. The disturbance in behavior causes clinically significant impairment. They may not experience clinically significant significant distress. They may not have a problem with their behavior or the situation, um, but it causes clinically significant impairment in family functioning, in school functioning, in uh, if they are runaway and they're living on the streets, in health functioning. If the individual is age 18 years or older, criteria are not met for antisocial personality disorder. This can be diagnosed in people over the age of 18 uh, if we rule out uh, antisocial personality. We want to specify whether it's childhood onset type, where the person shows at least one symptom prior to age 10, or adolescent onset type, where they, sh where they show no characteristic symptoms prior to age 10. That also should perk your little spidey senses up. If they were trotting along just fine up to age 10, then all of a sudden they went from being a model student or a model individual to conduct disorder. What the heck happened? What happened to precipitate the development of these behaviors? Conduct disorder can be diagnosed in people who are in children who are in preschool 
through adults, according to the DSM-5 TR. So remember, oppositional defiant disorder can also be diagnosed beginning in preschool. And it's important to note the difference. Conduct disorder, the symptoms are significantly more severe, significantly more aggressive towards other people. Conduct disorder notes, it's often preceded by oppositional defiant disorder, but not always. People with conduct disorder frequently misperceive the intentions of others as more hostile and threatening and respond with, they with what they perceive as reasonable and justified aggression. This again may be indicative of a person who's experienced chronic trauma and their HPA axis has become dysregulated. They go from feeling steady state or numb or whatever they're feeling, you notice I'm not saying safe or content because a lot of times they don't feel that way, to raging. And in other videos, I've called this the flat to the furious. And that is a result of their stress response system turning down its sensitivity. So things don't bother them too much that may normally have bothered them. They're, they're nervous system says, you know, I just can't get upset about everything. I don't have the energy. But when something does trigger them for some reason, there is a tsunami of stress chemicals. We need to respect the individual's perception of the situation. If they perceive the situation as much more hostile and threatening than the victim, I guess we'll use that word, perceived it, we want to understand what was the difference? Why did they perceive it so much more hostile and threatening? And I would venture to guess that we can probably trace it back to them uh, traumatic experiences that were triggered by something that the person did, said, a smell in the air, a situation that, that triggered that trauma schema within within their bodies and remember van der kolk says that a lot of times trauma memories especially traumas from early childhood may not be memories that we can see with pictures or words they may be experienced as sensations and that that sensation would be one of intense fear people with opposite uh, conduct disorder often have negative emotionality and irritability poor self-control poor frustration tolerance, suspiciousness, insensitivity to punishment, thrill-seeking, and recklessness. Now that's really interesting, and those are great treatment targets for something with conduct, for someone with conduct disorder. Uh, the negative emotionality and irritability communicates to me that there is a disruption in their neurotransmitters, but it also communicates to me that likely they are hypervigilant. They are not feeling safe. So they are constantly in this fight or flight mode and they're perceiving things from a threat-based standpoint, which contributes to irritability. And the poor frustration tolerance and poor self-control goes along with HPA axis dysregulation. Suspiciousness it seems to be a reasonable response when you've been betrayed, traumatized, or victimized in the past. Insensitivity to punishment may develop as a result of the abuser being harshly, um, de dealing out harsh punishments, whether it is verbal abuse or physical abuse. The individual learns how to check out. They learn how to dissociate and become insensitive to the punishments. And thrill-seeking and recklessness, those are dopamine-driven behaviors. Those are behaviors that are not uncommon to see in people who want to feel pleasure. They want to feel escape. They want to feel something. And for someone who is flat most of the time, that may be the only way they can trigger enough of a excitatory response to feel pleasure. Remember our, our um, 
excitatory neurochemicals can be associated, depending on their balance, can be associated with fight, flee, or fun, if you will. Conduct disorder should not be diagnosed in individuals in settings where patterns of disruptive behavior are viewed as near normative, such as in very threatening high crime areas, straight out of the DSM-5 TR. This is another important thing to note. So look at the person in front of you. If they are living or if they are coming from an environment that is characterized as threatening or high crime, then conduct disorder would not be diagnosed. Intermittent explosive disorder is another common diagnosis that we see. In intermittent explosive disorder, recurrent behavioral outbursts are grossly dis disproportionate to the provocation. So that sounds a lot like um, dysregulation, which represents a failure to control aggressive impulses and causes marked distress or impairment as manifested by one or both of the following. Verbal or physical aggression toward property, animals, or people more than twice a week for at least three months. The physical aggression does not result in damage, destruction, or injury. So the person has these explosive outbursts more than two times a week for at least three months. Or they have three or more outbursts that involve damage or destruction of property and or physical injury against animals or people within 12 months. It is possible and actually not that uncommon to see people with both of these criteria where they have these outbursts that are non-destructive, non-damaging, no less threatening, but non-damaging a couple of times a week with regularity, but they have these uh, other episodes, other outbursts interspersed where they go even further and there is destruction of property or physical injury. Outbursts are not premeditated and are not committed to achieve some tangible objective. That differentiates intermittent explosive disorder from antisocial personality disorder, for example. The person doesn't think, is, can I intimidate this person to get their wallet, to get their car? This is a non-premeditated outburst. Chronological age is at least six years, and symptoms are not better explained by another mental disorder, medical condition, or the physiological effects of the substance. This diagnosis can be made in addition to the diagnosis of ADHD, conduct disorder, oppositional defiant disorder, or autism spectrum disorder. And I also mentioned in the, in the write-up um, in people with dementia, uh, when recurrent outbursts exceed what is usually seen with those disorders. So if they have meet criteria for one of those other disorders that does have um, behavioral outbursts as part of them, that's fine. But if the outbursts are significantly severe uh, so as to become a focus of clinical attention, then you can concurrently diagnose intermittent explosive disorder. Pyromania and kleptomania. Multiple episodes of deliberate and purposeful fire setting in pyromania or failure to resist impulses to steal unnecessary objects in kleptomania. For both of these disorders, there is a tension release. The tension builds up. They feel this need, this urge to either set a fire or to steal something that they see. And they experience intense pleasure when they follow through with the action. That's their only motivation. It's not to destroy property. It's not to injure or be vindictive in any way. This is a tension release behavior. In pyromania, the person may have fascination with fire and its consequences. And these behaviors are not better explained by another mental disorder. The DSM-5 TR does note that fire setting behavior alone is not sufficient for a diagnosis of pyromania. If somebody is an arsonist, if they are not doing 
it for tension release um, in order to produce pleasure and if they don't have this fascination with fire and its consequences then they are not going to meet the criteria prevalence oppositional defiant disorder ranges from 2% to 11% and yes I checked multiple resources and multiple resources had this wide swath the reason given is due to difficulties in differential diagnosis and cultural insensitivity in differential diagnosis the uh, differentiating it from what is um, normal age developmentally appropriate for a child or differentiating it from other disorders uh, becomes difficult be, as for all the reasons that we mentioned and cultural insensitivity unfortunately some culturally unaware uh, clinicians may overdiagnose certain groups of people uh, I'm trying to choose my words carefully certain groups of people uh, overdiagnose them with oppositional defiant disorder when in reality or conduct disorder when in reality it is a uh, they may be demonstrating a trauma oriented response or they may be acting remember that clause for conduct disorder you can't diagnose it if the person is coming from a uh, traumatic environment or one where there is uh, high crime and you know how many of the people that have been diagnosed with ODD are in that category intermittent explosive disorder the one-year prevalence is 2.6 percent and the four uh, percent and the lifetime prevalence is four percent for the overall population however it's been found that intermittent explosive disorder is diagnosed 33 percent more often uh, among african-american and Car caribbean black adolescents we again need to look at whether there is some cultural insensitivity going on in our diagnosis or what the causative factors might be because 33 percent for this very limited group is a very very high group um, risk factors adverse childhood experiences I've said that repeatedly adverse childhood experiences you can go to aces too high which is the website but adverse childhood experiences include uh, physical abuse mental abuse emotion uh, emotional abuse sexual abuse neglect uh, living in a household where one or more people has a, a mental health or an addiction issue being in a situation in which caregivers disappear where there's abandonment they either go to jail or they go to get cigarettes one day and never come home or whatever the case may be those are the big um, adverse childhood experiences that are highly correlated with the development of mental health and physical health issues later in life so in this category risk factors for the development of these disorders as identified in the dsm-5 tr include pretty much all of those a history of child abuse or neglect a caregiver who has a mood or addictive disorder think about how that affects their parenting and their ability to form a secure attachment with the infant toddler or child it's pretty difficult if that mood or addictive disorder is uncontrolled exposure to violence this can be from caregivers or it can be domestic violence or it can be in their own neighborhood where they don't feel safe going to sleep at night inconsistent discipline and a lack of adult supervision family instability poverty or frequent changes in caregivers those are all risk factors identified for um, the disorders in this category oppositional defiant disorder as I mentioned before tends to be more defiant it's not aggressive it's not overt it's not in your face uh, most of the time with the exception of maybe trying to annoy somebody but it's not physically aggressive 
whereas conduct disorder is much more <clears throat> physically and verbally aggressive. Disruptive mood dysregulation disorder is given instead of oppositional defiant dis disorder if the person meets criteria. In disruptive mood dysregulation, the symptoms tend to be more severe and the irritability and anger is more persistent. In PTSD, a connection between behavior and trauma must be able to be articulated, even for children, which leaves us at, really at a loss since uh, chronic uh, or complex PTSD is not a DSM-5 TR diagnosis. We end up being at a loss because we know that complex trauma as a result of ACEs is common extremely common in these particular disorders. So are we really talking about a conduct disorder or a traumatic response? And, and again, I know I already said it, uh, how pathologizing, how much are we actually harming the person by giving them a conduct disorder diagnosis? My opinion, not in the DSM, how much are we harming the person by giving them a conduct diagnosis as opposed to a trauma-related diagnosis? ADHD is often comorbid. Honestly, when I went in to look for treatment strategies, it is so commonly comorbid with oppositional defiant disorder that I could not find anything, literally could not find any best practices for treating standalone oppositional defiant disorder. It was always ADHD with oppositional defiant or conduct disorder. In ADHD, symptoms only occur in response to sustained effort, attention, or stillness. If it occurs in other situations, then you may have comorbid ODD or conduct disorder. Substance abuse. The behaviors occur exclusively during a period of intoxication or withdrawal. Depression or bipolar disorder. The diagnosis of oppositional defiant disorder is not made if oppositional defiant behaviors are exclusively seen during a mood episode. Reactive attachment disorder. This was not mentioned anywhere in the write-up in this chapter. However, I think it's important to note because these ACEs, these, this problem in parenting probably resulted in um, attachment issues. And they did note as a risk factor having frequent changes of caregivers, which is one of the criteria for reactive attachment disorder. However, in reactive attachment disorder, the criteria are that the person has to be inhibited and emotionally withdrawn following extremely insufficient care. So it's a little bit different. They're not necessarily as a as oppositional defiant as they are withdrawn and resigned. Language disorder. We need to rule out the person being oppositional, defiant, irritable, frustrated because they don't understand instructions, whether it's because they can't understand the language or they can't hear clearly. We want to rule out hearing issues, vision issues, and other communication issues. Social anxiety would be diagnosed instead if the defiance is associated only with fear of negative evaluation. They are compliant at home. They're compliant with friends, for example, in small groups, but they become defiant in large groups of children or, for example, at school in which, when the teacher calls on them or when they might be in a position to be negatively evaluated. And we want to rule out antisocial or borderline personality. In these in personality disorders, according to the DSM, the, there are lower intensity outbursts than in intermittent explosive disorder. And antisocial personality can also not be diagnosed until the age of 15 years. With regard to suicidality, intermittent explosive disorder comorbid with PTSD was associated with a markedly elevated rate of lifetime suicide attempt, 41%. Now, what have I been saying throughout this whole class? The chance that somebody's um, 
emotional dysregulation, that their intermittent explosive disorder was precipitated by complex PTSD or PTSD is likely pretty good. Therefore, um, you know, I wonder whether that rate is even higher if you factor in complex PTSD, not just traditional post-traumatic stress disorder criteria. All disorders in this category are associated with a higher risk of suicidal ideation though. And that makes sense. People who are struggling with their mental health and struggling with interpersonal relationships likely will feel more angry, more unsafe, more disempowered, which can lead to more suicidal ideation. Treatment, parent management therapy is targets decreasing unintentional reinforcement of unwanted behaviors, positive reinforcement or negative reinforcement, which means uh, re reinforcing unwanted behaviors by providing undue attention or reinforcing unwanted behaviors by not responding to them at all. Just fine, whatever. Help parents identify appropriate consequences for disruptive behaviors. Many times, uh, parents may have evolved over the years trying to figure out how to interact with this child um, in a way that's become dysfunctional. So we need to back up, examine what the behavior means, you know, again, rule in or out neurological differences, rule in or out language difficulties, and then restructure the uh, discipline ladder, if you will and help parents learn how to make their responses timely, predictable, and appropriate. So there's consistency. Children crave consistency. And d discipline or correction is much more effective if it is timely, if it's proximal to when the behavior occurred, as opposed to the child getting in trouble for it four or five, six hours later. Parent-child interaction training has also been shown to be helpful at improving the relationship and dynamics between the child and caregiver. In terms of child-focused therapy, individual child therapy, helping them develop attachment security, self-esteem, and emotional intelligence, including emotional awareness, distress tolerance, and problem solving, have all been found to be helpful in working with people who have disorders that are in this category. Unfortunately, there was a surprising, in my mind, surprising lack of research on effective treatment strategies for dealing with conduct and impulse control disorders, which again makes me wonder whether this category has been stigmatized so much that, um, the researchers are reticent to even study it. I'm just hypothesizing, but it was shocking to me how little information there was on best practices. In terms of medication, stimulants have been shown to be effective with comorbid ADHD. However, the more pronounced the symptoms are, the less impact according to this particular study, the less impact the stimulants had on the oppositional defiant behavior, which could mean the more profound the symptoms are, the more traumatized the person might be. So it may not be neurochemical ADHD impulse related stuff. It may be trauma HPA axis related stuff. So it makes sense that a stimulant's not going to do the job because it's a whole different causative factor. In terms of atypical antipsychotics, only one, that's Risperdone, was found to be somewhat helpful with oppositional defiant behavior. However, some studies that I looked at indicated that medications which address comorbid mental health issues may tangentially also help with the um, oppositional defiant behaviors, which makes sense. If the person's symptoms of their other mental health issues are more controlled, they may feel more empowered. They may feel 
more um, safer or be better able to use their distress tolerance and emotion regulation tools. Free screening tools, the Vanderbilt ADHD Diagnostic Parent Rating Scale and the Swanson, Nolan, and Pelham Teacher and Parent Rating Scale. Obviously, they're designed to uh, assess for ADHD, but they also have subscales for oppositional defiant and conduct disorder. Oppositional defiant disorder is a relatively common diagnosis in children and adolescents, up to 11%. Since there's a high correlation between ACEs and the development of oppositional defiant and conduct disorder, it's important to consider the functions of the behaviors and accurately differentially diagnose from PTSD and specified or unspecified trauma and stressor-related disorders.